Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. It's really great to have so many people logged on today for the second discussion in this in this series, which is particularly timely and a very exciting discussion, I hope. I used to be quite cynical about the power of webinars, but I think the time has really come in lockdown and probably something we'll all get used to and keep on doing afterwards as well. One of our key strengths of business in the community is our ability to convene experts from across the private, public and third sectors in order to share experience and learning that promote responsible business to our members and to UK organisations more widely. I do hope that you'll find this webinar shows that strength. Almost all of us that are lucky enough to still have a job is working in a significantly different way than we were six weeks ago. I know people that are thriving in the new environment and others who are really struggling with stress, productivity, physical strains and mental health. With our partners at the Society of Occupational Medicine, we're really interested in how we learn from research and current practice to improve responses across UK businesses and turn changes that we've been forced to make into a force for good. The title of this webinar is Job Design that Enhances Mental Health and Wellbeing. The webinar will be recorded and the link will be sent to you along with a PDF of the slides and the evaluation form later on today or first thing tomorrow morning. One of the things I love about my role as head of training at Business in the Community is coming into contact with amazing experts who create positive change and today is no exception. We have four guest speakers that all provide leadership and inspiration to BITC we have a political strategist, champion innovation, and one of my favorite more and most panelists. We have two people who will be sharing their current approach to job design and mental health support, and a leader who's creating return to work guidance to help our companies, communities, and families get through this pandemic. Louise Aston is Business in the Community's Wellbeing Campaign Director. She works to create environments where individuals and organizations can be their best. Louise's background is creative, she transitioned from being a fashion buyer for Marks and Spencers into health campaigning through designing sun protection children's swimwear for a government skin cancer prevention program. While she lives off Portobello Road in West London, she's currently still holed up in a remote cottage in Norfolk where she went to stay for a friend in March, but got stuck when lockdown happened. Matthew Taylor is the chief executive of the RSA. The RSA have 30,000 fellows and a really great cafe if you've never been. During Matthew's tenure there, the society has substantially increased its output of research and innovation and developed a global platform as a global profile as a platform for ideas. In July 2017, Matthew published Good Work, an independent review into modern employment commissioned by the UK Prime Minister. He recently started a part-time role as a government director of Labour of Labour Market Enforcement and is also a member of its Industrial Strategy Council. Prior to this appointment, Matthew was director of the Institute for Public Policy Research and was also chief advisor on political strategy to the then Prime Minister, Tony Blair. Matthew is a regular media performer, having appeared in several times on the Today programme, Daily Politics and Newsnight, written and presented several Radio 4 documentaries and a panellist on The Moral Maze. His most important role, however, is on the BITC advisory board. Rachel Davidson is a general counsel of Ventures and Group Assurance at National Grid and is also the organization's UK executive sponsor for wellbeing in the UK. It is in this capacity that she chairs National Grid's wellbeing steering group and talks to us today. That group is responsible for driving the strategic direction of how National Grid supports its people around all aspects of wellbeing. Damon Sheba leads the culture direction and strategy at Santander. Through the COVID-19 response, he's been placing a proactive focus to ensure work design is linked to culture driving positive mental well-being outcomes across their 23,000 colleagues in the UK. Santander has weekly employee pulse surveys and found that more than three in four colleagues feel their mental well-being is supported as part of their day-to-day -day work. Both Rachel and Damien are, part, are members of our well-being leadership team at BITC. Nick Paul is a CEO of the Society of Occupational Medicine. SOM is the largest and oldest nationally recognized pro professional organization of health professionals with an interest in health and work. SOM's patrons are Lord Blunkett, Dame Carol Black, and Sir Norman Lamb. Nick has five kids, a wife who's a metropolitan police detective and is a keen table tennis player, one of the few sports that's still possible to enjoy in lockdown. SOM is one of nine national partners for our National Mental Health at Work survey. A lot of words in there for me to, to, to spill over. Sorry about that one. So this is the order for the day. Louise is going to kick, kick us off, setting the context of BITC's, BITC's interest. 
Matthew will set the vision of what good work could look like in the new world and how we can build on current demand to create opportunities to realize that vision. Rachel and Damien will share their experience of what's worked for their respective organizations and Nick will help us all imagine what returning to work might look like and what we might want to start putting in place to prepare for it. We aim to have around 20 minutes for Q&A if our esteemed panel managed to keep to the very tight slots that have been allocated. So please send in your questions as we go along via the chat box on your screen. It'd be really helpful to know who your question is for, unless it's for, for anybody in the panel. So let's kick off. Over to Louise. Thanks, Nick. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, big welcome to this second of our webinars. Um, I just really wanted to kick off that obviously we really recognise that right, right now that there's many, many people out there who are having an incredibly tough time right now. And, you know, the objective of this webinar is actually learnings from that acute phase to inform the recovery phase. So it's really about what are the constructive lessons we can learn in terms of what can we build on for the next phase as we as we progress. Next slide, please. So what I've tried to do here is, you know, obviously a few months ago, a pandemic such as coronavirus may have seemed pretty far-fetched, but now that it's playing out before us and serving as a reminder of the importance of business continuity planning and being aware of the much wider environment that in which you set your business where your business operates. Um, obviously, the response of business and the general public and social distancing was announced back on the 19th of March and then locked down on the 23rd. But the restri restrictions and the achievements that have been, been achieved have been absolutely incredible. And I think, you know, as Matthew and I were talking earlier, is the point is that a lot of these achievements have been built on pre-existing demands. Um, they haven't actually come from nowhere. And in terms of these, um, these achievements, I think it's really important that we just reflect for a moment. So one of the great things is the building of a kind of blitz spirit, this kind of morale in terms of things like Captain Tom Moore's 100th birthday walk for the NHS, where he's raised over 29 million, in terms of the fact that he's hit number one and you'll never walk again. Love the kind of caption line, end of the storm, there's a golden sky, which I think this is really what we're trying to talk about today. But you know, that blitz spirit has also resulted in really swift and agile decision making, which has cut through a load of long winded processes I mean, one example, I was talking to the commercial director at Bupa. He said, you know, we've been talking about working remotely for, you know, a couple of years, but we've actually actioned it all in six weeks. We've seen responsible business really stepping up with the BITC's National Business Response Network, which to date has brokered um, 221 matches of business resources and community needs um, and again, you know, this crisis has acted as a catalyst to create imaginative collaborations and partnerships never seen before. And that's something we really shouldn't lose. Obviously, the elevation of mental health on a par with physical health, you know, organisations like BITC, national kind of campaigns like um, Time to Talk, Time to Change. We've been campaigning on this for years. And but due to the impact of the pandemic, along with physical health, is mental health is now actually first and foremost in the minds of employers, and you know, which hasn't been achieved through years of campaigning. Um, there's also been we've seen a massive shift around kind of empathy, honesty, and compassionate leadership and management. And again, and again, this kind of whole awareness of humanity, people's whole lives, you know, we're all now used to seeing into the homes of colleagues and see their children and pets kind of roaming through the room. 
So again, that's sort of blurring between home and life. Um, we know that employees trust their employers to protect their health and safety. We've seen that through the Edelman Trust Barometer. So basically, employees are really looking to their employers to actually protect their health and safety. And of course, we've, you know, in just a few weeks, taking remote and flexible working to scale. Again, obviously, lockdown has been a massive accelerator. And what do we actually retain from that? And finally, to do with kind of school lockdown and other caring responsibilities, you know, again, we're actually being way more accommodating of people's other responsibilities. So next, please. So as Nick Corrigan said at the beginning, is every year we run a YouGov survey on mental health at work. And one of the things that we're really concerned about is that two in five, 39% of employees who experience a poor mental health due to work where work was a contributory factor in the past year. Um, again, that absolute lack of parity between physical and mental health, you'd never get away with that in terms of being injured at work by um, something physical. But again, is there a great opportunity with where we are at the moment with that kind of fast track parity to improve psychological health and safety? Is it possible for employers to really take ownership of job design that really does enhance health and well-being. Next, please. So, you know, again, it's back to responsible business. It's kind of rethinking about how do we design jobs that actually are really going to have a positive impact on mental and physical health. And, you know, that is a kind of big responsible kind of decision and now we have the opportunity to really rethink that. Next, please. So really the big challenge is how can we build back better? Um, is, you know, social distancing and variant, various kind of degrees of lockdown look set to continue for some time, but what are the constructive lessons we can learn from the acute phase to build back better? Thank you. Thank you, Louise, for setting that scene. Uh, so we'll move straight on to Matthew. Matthew, over to you. Thanks, Nick. Um, so the RSA, the organisation I run, um, right at the very beginning of this crisis, uh, even before we shut down our headquarters, um, had pivoted all our work to discuss what we call bridges to the future. And what we mean by that is trying to understand the ways in which this crisis could lead uh, to a better world. Now, I think when we think about the concept of uh, bridges to the future, uh, we need to understand why it is that crisis sometimes leads to change. And we'd argue that there are essentially three conditions which uh, contribute to whether or not crisis leads to long-lasting intentional change. The first is that before the crisis, uh, there is already pent-up demand and capacity for change. So change doesn't come from nowhere in a crisis. There needs to have been a prior demand for and capacity for change. And then secondly, in the crisis, the demand needs to be reinforced, but also critically that new assumptions, new practices need to be prefigured in the crisis. And so it's important to get a really granular understanding of what is changing out there and what is being prefigured when we think about the possibilities for after the crisis. And then thirdly, the third element is that as you come out of the crisis, through a transitional period, when people's minds are more open to change, you need to have the political alliances, the organizational alliances, uh, and the practical proposals, policies, and innovations ready to be mobilized in that period of time when people's minds are open to change. So 
There has to be demand, capacity prior, there has to be reinforcement and prefiguring during, and there has to be the alliances and the practical ideas at the end. And we are seeing at the RSA some fascinating examples of the kinds of practices that are being prefigured in this crisis, whether it's the way the NHS in London has really accelerated the putting aside of the internal market and competition between trusts as it shares its resources and acts as a single institution, or whether it's the way that local authorities are all catching up with the very best practice in terms of supporting members to be digital representatives uh, or working in a very agile way in terms of the use of data to get help to the people most in need, or whether it's charities like the Children's Society talking about a new spirit, spirit of collaboration both within the organization, but also working with other charities with whom they might in the past have been competitors for public contracts. So do those conditions apply to the concept of, of good work? Well, I would say the first one certainly does. There is a demand for us to improve the quality of work in our economy. And we have seen interesting examples, many examples of good work in practice. Secondly, I would say that the demand for good work for all has been reinforced in this crisis. And we have seen more examples of people doing things differently and thinking, think, thinking differently in ways which could prefigure the future. The question, of course, is whether or not we have the coalitions and the practical ideas to take the momentum of change into the world beyond the crisis. So what I want to do is I want to talk about three uh, ideas that I think are critical uh, as we think about the challenges and the opportunities of moving uh, beyond the crisis when that time comes. The first concerns the issue of inequality. So this crisis has absolutely underlined to us immense inequalities in people's experiences of work. In terms of insecurity, we already knew uh, that one of the great inequalities in our labour force was between those who had secure employment and those who were insecure in temporary work or in involuntary self-employment or low-paid self-employment. And that, of course, has been massively magnified in this uh, crisis. 28% in survey undertaken a couple of weeks ago, 28% of people uh, in insecure work have lost hours or lost their work in contrast, only 4% of salaried employees uh, were in that position two weeks ago. A second element is flexibility. So uh, for uh, better off people in the labor market, they have good levels of flexibility in terms of work life balance, and of course, critically being able to work from home if they want to. But broadly speaking, the further down the labor market you go, the more inflexible your work is. Now, of course, gig workers, have more flexibility in terms of the hours they work, but of course they lack security. The third dimension of inequality is the lack of relationship and fit between the importance of work for our lives and the value that is placed on it in the marketplace. And here we have seen an awakening amongst people of the incredible value of social carers, of delivery drivers, of retail workers, all of whom have continued to work often at personal danger in order to look after vulnerable people and make sure that people are able to cope during a lockdown. And so that will lead, I think, to a questioning of the relationship between people's market value and their value to society. And then a fourth important element of inequality has been to do with gender. Uh, we know from the statistics already that more women are having to reduce their hours or give up their jobs than men, almost certainly reflecting differences in uh, domestic, the burden of domestic responsibilities. A little bit of anecdotal evidence. Uh, we're seeing that academic citations during the crisis, more men, men are becoming more productive during the crisis as they lock themselves away in their study and think great thoughts, whereas women's productivity number of citations seems to decline, which again suggests that they are shouldering the, the majority of the burden of domestic uh, labour. So this crisis has also reinforced differences in gender and the interplay of work uh, and the domestic sphere. The consequences of all this, I think, could include uh, 
a demand for radically different forms of work organization, enabling flexibility uh, to all levels of work, very different and much more ambitious ways of thinking about job design, because we will finally rid ourselves of the idea that there are just dead end jobs for dead end workers that can never be improved or redesigned. I think people will be looking once again and possibly in more depth at their supply chains and the way in which even if their own workforce is secure and protected, they are implicated in insecure uh, and unfair work. And also, I think the strengthening of worker voice, reflecting in some senses the way that the employers who've listened to their workers have handled this better than those who have simply tried to impose on them. A second dimension, if the first is inequality, is around meaning and autonomy and challenging the very idea of work-life balance, where work is the domain of instrumentality and coercion and life is the domain of voluntarism and affect. Um, we uh, have seen many of us who don't do essential work have felt uh, acutely aware of the divide between those essential workers who are looking after the vulnerable, keeping the world going, turning around, and, and the rest of us. And I would include myself in that often. You know, David Graeber wrote an incredibly influential blog and book a couple of years ago, Bullshit Jobs, the number of people doing jobs who, when they're asked, don't really feel that those jobs uh, add value. So I think that more people will question their work, question the value of their work, want a stronger sense that they are contributing something. A second element driving this will be that people have got used to living with less. People have got used to not going out five times a week. They've got used to not buying new clothes. Having a fast car seems irrelevant. We may not be able to travel so much, whether it's for business or on holiday. And I think this might lead people to look for new trade-offs, uh, possibly accepting uh, less money and even less power in exchange for more meaning and more fulfillment. And I think this is going to lead us to ask some very profound questions about an idea that has been central to the kind of capitalist model ever since its beginnings, which is that work is something you do that you'd rather not do if you weren't paid for it. And possibly move beyond that idea into the idea that actually work should be a place of fulfillment and meaning uh, for everybody. However, taking those two notions, the notion that we will want to tackle inequality, systematic inequality, and we will want to try to provide meaning and autonomy and fulfillment for all work, there is a countervailing pressure. And that countervailing pressure, and I'm sure as you're sitting there listening to me, you're thinking this is, but what about the enormous pressure that we'll be under as we come out of this crisis, we're already under, to just get the business back on track and then having get back, got, it, got it back on track to make it profitable, to make it successful. And here I would point to a third and final uh, potential area of shift, and that's to do with governance, the way in which uh, we think about power and control in our workplaces. Because as we come out of this crisis, as we move through transition, there will be two models. One model will be a no frills command and control model, which says in order to get back to normal, we must strip things away. And there is precedent for this. The research shows that, for example, where voluntary worker engagement takes place, it tends to be downgraded when companies are under pressure. So one possibility is a retrenchment, control at the top, sacrifices uh, more imposed on those at the bottom, stripping away things like well-being strategies. Or there's an alternative strategy, and the alternative strategy is in it together, do it together. And I think the evidence suggests from the last crisis, 2007, eight, the financial crisis, and from what's happening now, that if you commit yourself to being in it together and doing it together, I interviewed James Timpson a few days ago for an RSA podcast and talked about the way in which he'd worked with his firm, where there's a long background of engagement and social responsibility. In it together, do it together, we'll have better outcomes. But if you come out of the crisis by sharing sacrifices, by people working together to come out of it, then surely you need to stick with those principles once you're out of that, once you're back to some kind of normality. So if you're going to be in it together and do it together, then surely this is an opportunity finally to achieve the shift we've talked about so long from the model of shareholder capitalism to a genuine model of stakeholder capitalism, in which what matters to the firm is the interests of everybody, the workers, consumers, citizens, wider society, 
not merely the abstraction uh, of short-term shareholder interests. So I think that there is enormous potential. But the final thing I want to say is this. I was asked when I did this talk to predict the future. I, I, I think the very act of prediction is problematic because to predict it denies our own agency and responsibility. And for me, the future is not out there. The future depends upon the decisions that we make, that you make as individuals, that you make as organizations, that we make as a society. Let's remember, we came into this crisis in societies that were beset by social polarization, economic inequality, and political populism. There was a need for change. So I'm not here to predict to you that we will tackle inequality, that we will bring meaning to work, that we will transform the governance of our firms. I'm merely saying to you that this is a possibility and the responsibility lies with us. And what will determine the future is the way in which we choose that future. Because in the end, it isn't so much hope that leads to action, it's action that leads to hope. Thank you. If everyone had their microphones on, I'm sure we'd be hearing a great round of applause for that one, Matthew. Thank you very much. I found it really, really inspiring to uh, that idea that we should have some hope and there is a better way out of this one um, was really useful for me. Thank you very much. So we'll now hear from our two guest speakers who have um, who are bringing their own their own organisations into this to see what they've actually done. And if there's anything you want to pick up from Matthew's Rachel as well as you as you as you're going through. Please do how much hope you feel. So we'll, so we'll do Rachel first and then we'll come on to Damien afterwards. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Nick. And um, thank you, Matthew. There, there are a couple of themes at the end of your um, points that I wanted to, to pull out. Um, for us um, at National Grid, it's really been um, about that trust and care and support for the colleagues we work with and um, across the whole organisational. Um, this has brought um, a, a great deal of change for everyone very suddenly. Um, so next slide. Um, so I, I really just wanted to highlight um, that we've all had to adjust uh, and we've all had to adjust very rapidly and people have managed that in different ways. Um, so I really like this quote um, I can't quite remember where I, I found it, but it, it is uh, really emphasises that everyone is going to have different responses to this. And National Grid has been about um, finding some structure and finding um, some, uh, you know, principles and guide rails and encouraging their people and managers to um, respond where they can to those. But it hasn't been. Um, prescriptive about how people are responding um, and working for this. So I'm just going to run through um, very quickly um, a, a couple of examples of the information that we've provided um, across the organisation. So next slide. So the first thing was acknowledging that there has been uh, this great deal of change for everyone. Um, we're a business that spans territory of operation um, right across the UK, but also in the US. Um, sorry, the US, that, that obviously means we've got um, different regulatory environments. We've had um, different approaches from governments in our operating territories, and that has mean, meant that we've had to adapt. So what we've tried to do is remind people of their um, flexibility in working remotely while they can, but also acknowledge that we have field staff, we also have um, control room staff, who haven't been able to switch to working remotely. So while the majority of us are working from home, um, we do have frontline workers who have been designated as, as key workers. Um, they're on site, they're out fixing assets like um, power lines and gas pipes. Um, they're managing our control rooms and, and keeping the energy across the UK um, balanced you know, minute by minute. And we're all being asked to work in different ways. And to Matthew's point, it's that trust and support, and it needs to come from um, your colleagues and peers, but it needs to come in a exchange um, 
rather than a command and control method. So while we are asking people to work from home where they can, um, we, we are encouraging them to do it safely um, as we should, and we're giving them items and tools that they can think about. So I'm just gonna click through how we've done that. So um, remote working, we've reminded everyone how to do that as effectively and safely as possible. Um, we've reminded them that they don't need to always be contactable and we've reminded them of the importance of some of the, the key themes that we uh, know affect both physical and mental well-being, um, exercise, eating well, continuing to socialise. Um, next slide. We've also tried to simplify the channels that we communicate through. We've uh, moved back to having um, simplified communication from senior managers um, and we have encouraged the direct communication to be from across peer groups and uh, between managers and individuals so it can be more personal and tailored to individuals. So, um, you know, some of these are pretty straightforward and simple, but for others, it's been really important to have structure that, um, you know, they can turn to and guidance that they can follow of how to make that working from home um, shift that happened very quickly, um, as simple as possible. Next slide. So we also made sure that we accommodated that not everyone is working uh, from home, that we do have field staff, we do have people out. Um, next slide again, this was for home working as well, where the slides will be sent out afterwards. We, we did also acknowledge that we have field workers um, and those field workers are, um, are going to be um, working with different requirements. And um, we've also had field staff um, approached, you know, asking with, with, with comments and questions from the public about why they're working. So we've provided them with guidance uh, to be able to answer those questions that have come from the public and to make sure that also um, that they are keeping themselves as safe and, and working um, in ways that are as clear as they can be. So in some of our control rooms, we have had to have um, us workers to um, live away from their families to keep them as safe as possible, uh, given that these are facilities that need to work 24-7. Um, and finally, we've also recognised that the coronavirus is going to have an impact on just more than working from um, home in a different way. There are also going to be very different situations that people are facing into. So we've also provided guidance on um, incidents like how you respond to um, supporting a peer or a colleague or a team member with domestic violence. So we've got a slide on that. What we issue guidance indicating that we have uh, material that is available. Um, we provide a number of pointers. We've also reminded people about our availability of our employee assistance program. And we've also um, indicated to managers that they should be aware of, of these signs. And then the final um, one is we, we have also recognised that facing um, us as a society at whole is going to be people dealing with grief. Um, we've had, um, obviously, as a society, we're, we've been struck by the, the huge numbers of people who are falling ill and sadly passing away to this virus. And we know that our employees and our colleagues are going to be no different. So we've provided um, simple, um, accessible um, support, both for managers and employees, so they will know where to go to. So they're obviously not expected to um, be counsellors, but they're going to want to be able to have conversations with their people um, and know where to point. Uh, so that's just a a whistle-stop tour of some of the things that National Grid has been doing to support both our key workers who are still out in the field and all of those of us who've had to rapidly change from working from home. Um, I think, Nick, I'm handing over to Santander. Thank you very much, Rachel. It's really good and I'm sure we'll get more from Santander. I think sometimes we struggle to think of what a whole person approach to wellbeing looks like at a time like this. And I think you gave us some really great examples of that from, from bereavement to mental health to domestic violence. So thank you for sharing uh, those from National Grid. Damien. 
Thanks, Nick. Uh, and, and thanks, Rachel, as well. I, I think um, I, I've been to the next slide. And one of the things um, we've been thinking about as part of this webinar is actually what will be the things that you might want to consider as we go into the recovery phase. And, and much like National Grid, we have a, a portion of our colleagues who are key workers providing essential frontline support uh, through our branch network and contact centres to our customers, but also a large proportion of our colleagues um, working from home. And, and there are five key areas I think that we want to um, really think about as we've been through this period, but also what do we take forward as, you know, some of the good emerging cultural pieces that we're seeing um, aligned to the mental health at work commitment number two, and to look at how we proactively ensure work design and organisational culture provides those positive mental um, health outcomes. Um, I really like Rachel's quote a second ago, and I think I read that, and I can't remember where I saw it from as well, it is around you're at home during crisis trying to work. And, and not actually working from home flexibly. And I think this brings us to the, the first point we're considering. I mean, what will be flexible working? And, and one of the things I think it's important that we do think about is actually how people are working now is not flexible working, but actually at home during a crisis trying to work. But what we are seeing are some really great cultural attributes that we need to think about how do we take those forward? For example, a lot of people now are having some positive responses to the value of permission to have a, a more work-life balance and to work flexibly. And I think a lot of people now are understanding people's individual needs and, and really having great conversations around themselves personally. But we're also thinking about how we can support colleagues and, and, and either in teams or through managers around um, working more flexibly or, or what their home parts are. Um, I think a second key area for us has definitely been um, the importance of leaders demonstrating empathy, honesty and compassion um, to ensure this positive, caring and supportive climate. And, and I think actually the more, more so around empathetic leadership and actually the importance of having that in place alongside um, as a leadership style and, 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 to, and, and for managers to be demonstrating, leaders to be demonstrating that um, to support um, our colleagues. Um, I think a third area, and I think I think Matthew touched on it before as well, is just around how we're listening to colleagues at the moment. And um, one of the five actions actually in the commitment is to create these opportunities for employees to feedback when culture and conditions might be driving poor mental well-being. And and we launched a continuous listening survey. Um, which was just based on five key questions um, to really understand actually how are our colleagues feeling at the moment, how is their well-being, how are they being communicated with, um, alongside the free text area as well, so we could really look at the themes that are coming out from there. Uh, and I think that was quite important actually to make sure that colleagues had the opportunity to speak up, but also that we could understand actually how they were feeling at the time as well. Um, Around about a year and a half ago in Santander, we repositioned our wellbeing strategy across four pillars. So the four pillars being mental, um, physical, financial and social wellbeing. And actually what we've seen is the, the rise of the importance of the social wellbeing as one of our four key pillars. Uh, and, and actually the connection between our colleagues and our communities and, and their environment and, and, and really developing those strong support networks. And the other area for this as well for us is that sense of belonging. Um, and the importance of actually inclusion um, throughout this time as well. And, and um, the DNI team within my team have been doing some great work to really look at how do we make sure um, that people across the organisation do feel included. And we're also really highlighting DNI um, as an important topic at the moment. And I think the, the final and fifth um, part for us really was really about the, the wellbeing narrative. And, and just making sure that we're continuing to promote our focus on uh, having an open culture around um, about mental health and mental well-being. And we launched uh, an app um, which actually we launched with uh, the where colleagues can actually um, at a click of a button get access to a qualified psychologist, um, which is a great enhancement to that. Um, and also as well, we've provided lots of ongoing communication and guidance to colleagues um, around how to support their mental well-being throughout this time as well. So, so I think overall, I think these are the five areas that we're really considering about what is it we want to see to take forward into the recovery phase and definitely how do we really approach this term flexible working what will this mean for us? Um, the importance of empathetic leadership, um, the importance of continuous listening and listening to our colleagues throughout this and also how do we take that forward 
um, and, and social well-being and belonging as a key part of our well-being strategy uh, and also then the well-being narrative and that continuation of having an open culture around mental well-being which has really come out throughout the crisis um, and that people have felt more open to talk about how they're feeling about that uh, and I think these five key areas are, are quite critical to uh, the mental health at work commitment um, commitment number two in, in really starting to build that and support colleagues through um, through their mental well-being. Thanks, Nick. Thank you very much, Damon. As we said, these slides will be available afterwards. So if you think there's something you can learn from <coughs> Damon's really clear five points there, you will have those slides afterwards. Uh, so last but not least on the, on the panel, if we can bring Nick in. I don't think we've got your video, have we, Nick? So we'll- No, I hope that. you can hear me. We can, I can hear you fine, so I'm assuming everyone else can. Okay, uh, thanks Nick and uh, great to be here along with the other panellists. Um, I'm going to talk about preparing for recovery, building back better, so we're working on the Return to Work Toolkit um, with the ITC and others like CIPD, the Federation of Small Business and Mind, uh, so that's draft and work in progress with an expert um, group. So where are we now? I mean in terms of Covid and um, you know who's working where well, obviously Certain industries continue to function, as we talked about telecommunications, transport, emergency, and uh, we've been providing advice in terms of protecting those employees, obviously with <laughs> some difficulty with things like PP um, and in accordance with government guidance. And it's worth um, saying that tomorrow is World Safety at um, Work Day um, and uh, people like the RCN and um, others are doing a memorial. Uh, time at 11 a.m. for those who have died at work. So, you know, awful situation for those having to continue sometimes. But um, certainly industries uh, have done incredibly well to continue and um, occupation has been part of that. And we've produced blogs, as many of <laughs> others have done, on working at home during challenging times and technology and COVID. Uh, the next slide, I think, is, uh, you know, part, part of this is um, sort of the government policy, you know, preparing for easement, um, you know, if you look at the press conferences, um, from the government, they're looking at the flattening of the curve. Uh, their five tests. Um, and clearly, if that's not in place, uh, then it won't ease. But um, if it does ease, and then things start to rise as we move back into um, lockdown, um, I mean, a key part is testing. There isn't a kind of effective mass test. Um, in place, um, and that is a big part of the solution. Test, test, test. Obviously, WHO is a mantra, and rightly so. Um, so you can understand who has the infection, those who haven't. I mean, key workers do have access to a test, but um, there are problems with all the other tests in terms of uh, how specific and sensitive they are. But when testing happens, it should be shared with occupational health, clearly, as a workplace health decision. But when we come to easement, we need to look at a particular data that you might have as employers um, in terms of who's been off and the absence and the reason for that, you know, uh, be it from COVID or you've been looking after loved ones, um, vulnerable people, uh, if you've been suffering from bereavement, have particular caring responsibilities and that data needs to be looked at uh, once the government uh, decides to ease um, lockdown. Um, and people obviously will be worried at, um, you know, their position in terms of risk to encounter the COVID infection. Very sadly, it looks like <clears throat> COVID won't be going away anytime soon. So it's about minimising the risk. And I suppose one of the things occupational health does is uh, walks the tightrope between the evidence base and what we know of, lots of things we don't know, um, and um, the particular situation for a workplace. And um, people, <clears throat> obviously there's been uh, amplification of risk or maybe the risk in, the, in your terms has been right um, but now go, with these government's going to have to flip to um, you know we'll stay at home it's uh, there's huge risk to go to work um, the risk is less and that's going to be difficult for the government and um, and as um, BITC rightly say the employer is this kind of trusted advice the most trusted advisor so um, they will have to be um, ready and prepared and HR obviously is critical for that role of management and leadership even more critical specialist advice from occupational health can be part of the solution. Um, next slide so so general issues I mean just thinking about you know returning to work um, people will definitely be retaining social distancing how is that going to work um, different workplaces are going to have different solutions from 
uh, you know, teaming where one team comes in one week, another team another week, or one team comes in the morning, other in the afternoon. Um, that lifts will, for example, have a limited number of people in there, so hospital offices will only be allowed 50% of capacity. There's, there's the, how that distancing happens uh, will have to be put in place and thought out before easement happens. Testing, ideally, and you still haven't got the detail of that, um, but testing should be definitely coming along to a certain extent, but maybe it won't, in which case um, there's these things like distancing and the working environment needs to be looked at very clearly. Um, it can't be overemphasized the role of leaders to kind of really think about these issues, you need to think about them now, set those expectations, you know, absolutely what uh, Matthew has been saying in terms of readjusting, you know, resetting the, the button so we have a better way of working um, for good work, I think is really, really important because that is the key driver for good health and well-being in the workplace. Um, there will be risk assessment for particular health issues and there are various Risk assessment tables that occupational health professionals have worked up for, you know, neurological conditions to other specific health conditions. And um, uh, unfortunately, um, um, Public Health England perhaps hasn't got, hasn't got that way. I think we're ahead of the curve on this. And um, I'm not sure when we challenged Public Health England on what basis, for example, they did the 70 plus, the vulnerable group, um, whether that's actually scientific. So we're taking a more scientific approach than them. Uh, you might be pleased to hear. I mean, clearly different personality types will need different support. Some people want to stay at home and they got used to it, and, but then how do you create innovation and work as a team, help new people come into the organisation, needs to be worked through. Uh, there's clearly special support for people who've had um, bereavement. I mean, the so, you know, there's so many people who have suffered in this area. Uh, crews, bereavement care flockers on the wider uh, bereavement support. An extra effort needs to be made to make re those reasonable adjustments and with particular issues for people who redeployed and furloughed and some people uh, might just decide I'm not going to return to work and do something else and I think it's all the time for us to reflect on what why we're we doing what we're we doing next slide I mean, in terms of kind of vulnerable stuff um, they need to be identified adjustments need to be made uh, managers need to really spend that time with those people getting advice from HR occupational health about what is the best way of um, both kind of uh, working with those staff that, um, to get the best outcome for the employee and employer, um, do a risk assessment, um, and again, occupational health can advise on that, and um, there might be alternative work arrangements. I mean, currently, as I said, and there's, hopefully you know, there's people who are extremely vulnerable, and those at um, increased risk of severe illness, and, um, but uh, there will be that vulnerability for the working age population that um, employers will have to work through um, again the specialist advice and HR. Uh, so kind of coming back to return to work, planning physical environment, kind of doubling down on that. I mean it's not any sort of lifts and social distancing, it's kind of hand washing, respiratory etiquette, um, staggered shifts I've talked about, um, you know, reducing crowding in areas. I think we, I'm sorry. Um, and that conversation is so important with managers. Yep. With their staff. We so lost you. Uh, what the first day will look like, what to expect. There are people who'd be really, really worried by that. Are we? Okay, you, the slides, as I say, will go out, and I'm sure Nick has a rousing conclusion on the end of his slides, so you'll have to read it rather than listen to him because it was getting a little bit hard to hear and I'm getting a few people telling me that they were struggling. So sorry if you can still hear me, Nick. I'm sorry to cut you off there. Uh, it was ceasing to work for people. I do have a couple of uh, couple of questions for other members of the panel, though. I have a Somebody's asked a question from Matthew about your third of your conditions, which was about having alliances in place. Place to to maximise change and create the change. And one of one of the listeners asked, uh, "What's a what's a role in business around? What's a role for for UK businesses in creating those alliances or in trying to influence those alliances?" So and I think that's really, can... I think that's a really important uh, point. Uh, so let's let's think of two crises that many of us have lived through. So if you think of the uh, AIDS crisis, which was an incredible tragedy. It's worth, when we look at the figures for the deaths, just reminding ourselves that, for example, 
in the United States alone, AIDS meant three, you know, led to the death of 300,000 mainly younger men. Um, and there are interesting parallels to that crisis. But the important thing is that in, in today's context is that we came out of that crisis with a positive momentum in terms of the community themselves, the uh, gay community changing their behaviors, in terms of uh, treatment and investment in treatment, which ultimately led essentially to this no longer being a chronic condition, but also in relation to public attitudes. Um, and this led inexorably to uh, um, equality for uh, LGBT communities. Now, it didn't have to be that way. I'm old enough to remember the middle of that crisis. And in the middle of that crisis, it felt quite possible the gay community would retreat and that the attitude of governments would be to stigmatize and stereotype those who were the main victims of that terrible disease. But actually, the gay community mobilized and wise public officials recognized that it wasn't useful to scapegoat certain people, but instead to talk about public behavior as a whole. And it led to a positive shift. Now contrast that with 2007, 2008. You come out of that crisis and there's a, an assumption that you know, we'll learn some of the lessons about what was wrong with the economy and the, over, the, the, the excessive power of finance, the importance of inequality. But one of the things that happened out of that crisis was that centrist and social democratic parties were exhausted and trying to hold on to power. Meanwhile, radicalism was expressed in the Occupy movement, the 1% movement, and there was a split. And so instead of people getting what they thought they were getting after that financial crisis was a kind of reset, a progressive reset of the global economy, things went in the opposite direction in terms of how we responded in terms of the politics. So in terms of this crisis, I think business has an incredibly important role to play because I would say over the last 10 years, so many businesses like the ones we've heard from today have really taken forward the agenda around environmental and social responsibility. And meanwhile, politics has gone in reverse direction. And so in my line of work, I find it much easier to talk to business leaders about the long term, about inclusion, about responsibility, about climate change than I do most politicians. And so this is the opportunity, but I've been talking to quite a few business leaders in the last few weeks as part of the RSA's work, and this is the challenge. And, you know, it's a really interesting question for all of you talking to your chief executives or the chairs of your boards or whatever. Business wants to do the right thing, but generally speaking, business does not want to be the first ones over the parapets. You know, they want to wait for other people to provide leadership. And I would suggest to you that this is a time when actually we could do with businesses saying, look, there are two paths out of this in terms of business getting around their feet and economic growth. And we want to choose the progressive, inclusive, sustainable route, not a kind of chuck everything out and just go for growth approach. So really critical role for business, but it will involve some businesses coming out of the comfort zone, providing real leadership. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Matthew. A question, another question, I think if we can hear Nick, he might come back on this, but I think you, Rachel, you might have a perspective on this. Somebody's asking about, from global organisations where they're working across different different uh, different countries, which have different recommendations, how how can we have a consistency of messaging? If your US head is telling you that everyone must wear face masks and be um, and have their temperature checked by the time they come in, and the UK we're saying two meters, in Spain they're saying you know one and a half meters. How do you get consistency in a global organisation and keep credibility? Mm -hmm. well, can you can you hear me? Uh, let's just get Rachel in first, Nick, and yeah. that, quick one from Rachel, and then we'll finish with you. Is that all right, Nick? Yeah. I, I was going to say, I, I don't think we can be consistent all the time in terms of, you know, different government recommendations need to be followed. What we can do is provide the structure about keeping people safe at, within the guidelines that their local governments are suggesting. We work with those, but we can also... Um, suggest to people the things that they can have within their remit of control. Because certainly from a, a mental health um, a well-being perspective, um, it's about what people can control or influence. And I think giving people some of those structures and some of those items um, and those sort of guidelines, if you like, can, can be the most helpful. Um, and otherwise, it is just acknowledging that, you know, this is a complex problem that's dynamic and changing. Um, if we all knew how to solve it um, immediately, well, 
we wouldn't be on webinars. Um, so I think the fact that different governments have different approaches shows that you know we've got to have a collaborative way forward to addressing it. Brilliant. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Nick, if you if we can hear you now, let's see. Yeah. So um, I would say, um, of course, there's different laws for things like. Um, face masks and I don't know how people um, are legally treated as employees from country to country, but there are principles in terms of good work, um, good management and leadership. And the so multinationals, for example, BP, they look at teams right across the globe and uh, can see which teams are working well. If they're not working well, they're talking to management and leadership about it. So I think sticking to the principles and looking at uh, good job design, good management and leadership um, is the importance of cross-national issue to focus on. Great. Um, we have another question about. Oh, it's quite um, about. I think maybe maybe we can get the Santander perspective on this. That it's one thing to have an organisation's, you know, an organisation's leadership uh, saying the right things around well-being, but when it's just coming, when it comes down to and standard uh, management that that seems to get in the way that that's still getting in the way for some people is that middle management level that you're not getting through the vision at the top to people's lived experience how are you we've only got a couple of minutes for this but any any thoughts on Santander first and then we'll come to you Matthew and um, I think it's important actually we, we actually have seen the opposite and actually through through this time we've seen our middle managers showing empathetic leadership um, as well at the same time and, and I think it's we know that culture is always driven from tone from the top um, as well and actually if we see that that always translates down but, but I think as well our, our, our colleagues are having much more conversations with their managers around these pieces which in, in some ways allows that conversation to happen um, but, but I think we recognise the importance of that and I think we we put some some really great training and, and learning available for our middle managers as well in these topics and, and I think it's an important thing to use definitely. Brilliant. Matthew we're going to pop in for Less than a minute on that one. You're muted, I'm afraid. Sorry, uh, schoolboy error. Um, uh, I just wanted to reiterate the importance of, kind of having a kind of granular perspective on this. It's not something which can be answered in abstract. You have to get down to the specificities of what's happening. So if people go to um, my Twitter feed at RSA Matthew, there's a framework developed by a colleague of mine, Ian Burbage, which uh, you'll see if you look down my timeline so he said that we can think of understanding crisis measures under four headings firstly end by which he, he means these are things that people have done to respond to immediate demand but they're specific to the crisis therefore we won't continue with them a second category is um, uh, amplify um, and amplify is we've been able to try new things and they show some signs of promise for the future so we might want to look about doing more of those the third category is let go, which is that we've been able to stop doing things that we were doing. You know, organizations saying, well, forget KPIs, you know, forget um, splits between commissioners and providers. Um, and so those are things we're able to stop doing. Um, and we're realizing now they may be unfit for purpose. We should never start them again. And then finally restart, which are things we've had to stop doing in the crisis, but actually we need to start them up again. And the question is, how do we start them up again? So I think thinking about the things you end, the things you amplify, the things you let go and the things you restart is an interesting way of assessing the way in which people are responding to the crisis. Thank you, Matthew. If, would it be okay if you can you send a link to that particular thing and we'll make sure that goes out uh, with the slides. Is that all right? Send that line and we'll do that. So I always promise we'll keep these to time, so I will. There's been lots of really positive feedback uh, as, well as, as well as questions on here, particularly positive feedback uh, around bringing in the uh, the gendered nature uh, of, of the crisis and bringing in other other experiences in terms of LGBT experience in here as well. So showing showing the different lenses of diversity on any crisis seems to be welcomed by the audience listening. So thank you very much for everybody that listened and thank you very, very much to all our panelists uh, for, for today's webinar. As I've said a couple of times again, you will be sent all the slides and a link to watch the recording again or to send that to anyone else. Thank you very much. Wave from anybody that's still on before I hit finish. Okay. Bye bye.
and then there is just me. Alina, does this now go?